Winston Churchill essentially saved Western civilization. William Lyon Mackenzie King is the longest serving prime minister in the history of the British Commonwealth. They worked together during the most important war in the history of the world. They had a 50 year long friendship. And yet, until now, there have been no books about this relationship. So thank you to Terry Reardon, who's the author of Winston Churchill and Mackenzie King, So Similar, So Different, for filling that breach. Welcome to TVO. Thank you, Steve. I can't figure that out. So I need you to start by telling us, how can it be that this relationship, which clearly was a close one, a long-lasting one, uh, two fairly significant people, you'd have to say, in the history of the world, why no books about this relationship? Mackenzie King is not an easy person to do a book on. He wasn't, uh, he didn't have the ability of Churchill to rouse people. He was dull, <laughs> but he chose to be dull because that's what he thought the Canadian people wanted. They wanted a non-threatening statesman. And he purported himself to be that because he thought that would appeal to the Canadian public and even more so to the Canadian voter. So if you look at the political record, he's the longest serving PM of all time. Yes. I guess he knew what he was doing. Exactly. Let's do a bit of a checklist here. Get comfortable, because this is going to take me a minute or so. Uh, having read the book, I wanted to go through what made these men so similar and then so different. Let's bring this up if we can, control room. Here's uh, Churchill and King. Their nickname's pretty close, Winnie and Willie. Their birthdays, again, they're born within a few weeks of each other. Uh, Churchill, November 30th, 1874, and King, December 17th, 1874. Height, they're both five foot six inches tall, both with blue eyes, both quite prolific writers, Churchill winning the Nobel Prize for Literature and King keeping a 30,000 page personal diary. Family connections to politics, Churchill's father was Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK and of course Willie King's grandfather was the Mayor of Toronto. Politics, Churchill an MP for 62 years, King an MP for 32 years, Churchill and PM for nine, King PM for 22. Now, how about so different? Churchill, fiery, impetuous, charismatic. King, cool, calculating, bland. Churchill, a tremendous sense of humor. King, no sense of humor at all. Churchill, grudging respect for political opponents. King, contempt for political opponents bordering on hatred. In their personal lives, elected for the first time at age 25 was Churchill. King, not till 34. Churchill married to Clementine for 57 years and had five children. King, never married, no kids. Talk about different. Okay, Terry, take us to Toronto. December 1900, their first meeting. How'd they get on at that meeting? In Ottawa. Mm. Yeah, they, uh, it wasn't too good. Uh, it was 11 o'clock in the morning and Churchill was drinking champagne. <laughs> Already. So it didn't go down to the, as I say in the book, uh, even though with a lot of good attributes, but uh, King all through his life was priggish. And uh, so and, he and didn't And forced war during the war, I think, did he not? That's right. So they, they wouldn't even have shared a drink at that point. No, definitely not. So Especially at 11 o'clock in the morning. Right. So yeah. they have the meeting and what's King's impression of Churchill afterwards? What do we know? Bad because he had to meet him four years later in London and he tried to get out of it. <laughs> but he actually did warm up to him a bit more and then two years after that they met again and uh, definitely was warming up. But then as with a lot of relationships, both in politics and in, and in ordinary life, things went down again, which we'll go into later. We shall. Let me, let me get you back to that meeting in England six yes. years after they first meet. And he's over there, King is, and he says, who do I have to see? And they tell him, you've got to see Winston Churchill, who's the Under Secretary of State for the Colonies. Yes. And King says what? He's the last person in England I want to see. So his But memory... he had to see him because it was to do with immigration to the Colonies, to Canada. And apparently there were some uh, smart people who were encouraging c people to come over to Canada with uh, rather exaggerated uh, features of Canadian life. They obviously didn't mention the weather, for one thing. So, uh, so that was to, to make sure that couldn't happen, so, and legislation was brought in. We know what King thought of Churchill after that first meeting. Do we know what Churchill thought of King no. after their first meeting? No. We don't, although we, get, we may have a hint of it, eh, when um, Churchill, a bit yeah. of a sense of humor coming to the fore at the second meeting? Yeah, he did say, I made a frightful ass of myself, didn't I, the last time? And King, being Kings, agreed. 
which is maybe not the most diplomatic <laughs> uh, retort, but uh, that's what he said. So Churchill had some memory of that first meeting and some awareness of the fact that he may have drunk too much. Yeah, well, of the, of the whole trip over here, when he came over in 1900, he actually cancelled at least one public meeting in Brantford because he had an argument with his agent, uh, Major Pound, who was a um, loud, what the words he used about it were not, he'd called him an um, American impresario, but sort of uh, uncouth and other words like that. So, uh, but he, he actually cancelled one meeting and uh, then it did apologize, but he blamed it on Pound, of course, mm -hmm. not himself. Uh, let's talk about their political re careers, which both started, I guess, relatively speaking, at uh, young ages. Churchill, at a very young age, uh, both started well, both faced setbacks. Uh, let's start with, I guess, King losing his first seat in 1911. Yes. Churchill being demoted after the Dardanelles. Talk about those events, if you mm -hmm. would, and how they both sort of suffered career crises around the same time. Well, King actually, well, his, his whole uh, idea, he wanted to get into politics <laughs> from, from early, early days. And, of course, he was. Uh, he actually was given the, the job of editing a new Labour Gazette by Wilfrid Laurier. And then he became deputy of civil service position, deputy minister of Labour. And, um, but what he did when he lost his job, he was out of work, they needed money, he was supporting his family, that he, uh, he'd, he'd built a reputation as a labor negotiator, a brilliant one, and you, we can see how King would be great at this. He would go through every little nitpicking point, he would get the people so tired, and then he would keep breaking it up, and, and actually, I think I quoted, of 41 labor disputes he was involved in, in that job of deputy minister of labor, he solved 38 of them. Hmm. Pretty good. And you can see how he would be great at that. And then after the, when he needed money, after he was defeated in parliament, and he goes down to the States. This is basically when the First World War started. Worked for the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, and other Bethlehem Steel and, and built a reputation for solving disputes, especially with Rockefeller. They had a dispute in Colorado with bloodshed with the miners down there. He solved that one. And he became a, he had a big reputation down there. So he's building himself back up yes. after losing his seat in 1911. That's right. Churchill, similarly, a rising star in his field. And then remind us what happened at the Dardanelle where it all came to a crash for him. The Dardanelles was not his idea. The, the point was to try to get Turkey out of the war. The plan was to invade Constantinople, take Ch Turkey, which was a uh, confederate or with, involved with uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary. And then they would also take pressure off Russia. Russia could then go down to the Dardanelles and um, that would help, help them. So the point was to try to get to Constantinople. They underestimated the Turkish soldiers, or the Turkish Navy as well, who had laid mines in there. So it was a complete disaster. He didn't get the support of Lord Kitchener, who was the head of the British Army, and that was crucial. And Churchill is what at this point? Churchill is First Lord of the Admiralty. Okay. So they, try, they tried it on, and it just didn't go. And so they had to have a scapegoat, and Churchill was it. As quite rightly, he was in that job. And that was how politics are. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, just too, too bad. And so he was given, he was demoted to the position of, ch of the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, which I think I quote um, Lloyd George stating, that was usually a position given to politicians who had exceeded their level of mediocrity <laughs> and, and usually of elderly. So he was given that, but he wasn't going to accept that. So he joined the army. And he, and as usual, with Churchill, who believed that he had this sort of, I wouldn't say guardian angel, because he, he was not religious. Mm. But uh, he felt he couldn't he wasn't going to die there, so he would march up and down the trenches, and all these other people were cowering in. 
he was lucky in one time he had to go and see his, uh, his superior and he didn't want to go. Why does he want to see me for? Okay, I'll go. So he goes and exactly where he was a short time later, a bomb drops on that spot. The person who was with him at the time was killed. So he had this... Uh, Better to be lucky than good. Well, they that's say. right. So, yeah. so he was um, all through the war, but then Lloyd George, who was now Prime Minister of the Coalition Government, who owed uh, Churchill one for helping him with a scandal he'd been involved with, Mar Marconi shares. And so he, against the views of the other people in the Coalition Government, the Conservative people, because Lloyd George was a Liberal, he appointed Churchill Man uh, Minister of Munitions. Hmm. And again, and Churchill, of course, did a brilliant job at this. And then he became Minister of Air and War, and so that he got his career back on track again. Let, let's continue to look at these two men as we have the lead up to 1939 yeah. and World War II. In that period of time now, where I guess we're in the 20s here, King met Benito Mussolini. What did he think of him? He thought the same as Churchill. Great guy. He thought he was a great guy. This was in the 20s, mm -hmm. and Churchill was even more worse because Churchill goes to see him, and I can't remember what position Churchill was, was he probably minister of the colonies then, because this was the early, early, early to mid-20s. And he, he actually said, basically, I would have voted for him if I'd been over there, hmm. because the idea of a benevolent dictatorship was widely viewed as being actually pretty good. The trouble is you rarely get a benevolent dictatorship. So Churchill changed his opinion in the <coughs> 30s, of course, and King took longer to change his opinion, but he obviously later on came to the same conclusion. Ethiopia and the bombing there might have had something to do yes. with that as well. Let's talk about Winston Churchill coming to, of all places, Maple Leaf Gardens, March 3rd, 1932. What can you tell us about that event? We have a, brings in a famous Canadian hockey gentleman, Foster Hewitt. He was speaking at, uh, he was getting, it was sponsored by the Simpsons department store. Churchill had used a, a lapel of some type of microphone when he was doing, speaking in the States. And he, and Foster Hewitt said, I'm sorry, sir, it'll, it, it'll reverberate with our system here. And he, Churchill, said to him, young man, if I want your advice, I will ask for it. <laughs> of course, he was right. Churchill was wrong. And uh, so he had to, so he refused to use, use a stand-up microphone. He just spoke, and half the audience couldn't hear him. So hmm. that was it. And in a building where, you know, 16,000, 17,000 people used to go to watch hockey games, yep. how many people showed I up that I think he night? had about five, 6,000 or something yeah, like that. It was how, disappointing. How can that be? He was, he was now 1932, he, he was not in a position. He, he'd, uh, he wasn't he'd who lost. he became yet. Yeah, he was. And <laughs> he started, he had, uh, when he lost his uh, position of Chancellor of the, of the Exchequer in 1929 when the Conservative Party lost the election, he came over to Canada, which we may be mentioned later as well, mm -hmm. and uh, he was and he basically, that was when he said he might emigrate to Canada because all the opportunities were here. <laughs> That's right. But he had ample opportunity because when he went back, the Labour Party started negotiations to, bring, to give home rule to India. And that was backed by the Conservative opposition. Church was very much against that. And so, in view of his strong stance, he was forced to give up his position as shadow chancellor of the Exchequer. So when he came over in 1932, he was uh, just a regular backbencher. And thus only five or 6,000 people go to see him at Maple Leaf right. Gardens. Uh, King, as we know, uh, had a, uh, quite a remarkable prime ministership insofar as I think he lost his seat three times. He lost his government a couple of times. He's uh, 1930, loses the election. 35, he's back in power now. And before World War II starts, he did something that Churchill never did. Willie King met Adolf Hitler. Yes. Tell us about that meeting. 1937, uh, von Ribbentrop, who was the, actually the ambassador to Britain, met King when he was over there. And he said, you know, it'd be a good idea. They knew that they actually had something in common, because Ribbentrop had actually worked in Ottawa prior to the First World War. 
importing German wines and various things. So whether they met each other then, I don't know. But they had something in common. And so Ribbentrop said, I think it would be a good idea if you go and see the Führer. And so King speaks to the uh, British uh, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, and he said, well, great idea. So because King was a great uh, supporter of the appeasement policy of Chamberlain. So he goes over there, and they have, it was supposed to be, I think, a 30-minute chat, and it finished up over an hour. And Hitler gives him, and he sounds so realistic and truthful. He says, we don't want war. I've been through a war. I was in the trenches in the First World War. We know what a terrible thing the war is. We don't want war. There will never be war at the instance of Germany. King laps this up, as it all, we all would do. I mean, there was a threat of war if someone's the person who you feel is going to be responsible for a war says, I don't want it. Oh, this is great. It's what you want to hear. Yeah. In King's Diary, he compares him to Joan of Arc. He has all these wonderful things. But to be fair with King, he does state to him that if Britain is attacked, Canada will come to Britain's aid. Hmm. So at least he does say that. Now, Obviously, he made no impression on Hitler. It certainly made no impression on his future actions. King, I think I read in your book, actually tried to ingratiate himself with Hitler by saying, I was born in Berlin. Yes, that's which right. Which, of course, he means Berlin, Ontario, sure, as sure. it was then called, now Kitchener. That's right. He's trying to find a little entry oh, sure. point with him in that sure. conversation. That's right. Uh, well, of course, uh, we all know what happened, uh, I guess, about a year later. Germany marches into the Sudetenland. Um, the war is not far away, and how long does it take King to change his mind about Hitler? Basically, he was, he was still an appeasement mentality. He felt that this man could be stopped. He, so he was slowly getting to the practice that he's not going to be. At the actual date, uh, it was a gradual process. Hmm. But even right up to the end, up to September 1939, King thought that Hitler could be stopped in his tracks. Because when there was talk uh, in newspapers of Ch Churchill being brought back into the government before, before September 1939, King states, then there will be a war. Because as soon as the Germans see that, they'll attack. Because hmm. they'll know that Britain is a danger to them. Of course, it was a ridiculous assumption, but right. uh, that was what his thinking was. Anything to stop a war. And as soon as Churchill is there, then it's game over. Is there any evidence that, that uh, Churchill would have wanted a meeting or a discussion or something with King after King's meeting with Hitler, in, in essence, some kind of debrief or something like that? No, the, there was. Um, this would be after, after this, when after, it was the day, actually, when this would, this would have been in 1938, when Ribbentrop was still the German ambassador to Britain. And uh, the day, it was the day that the Germany invaded Austria. Okay. It was a peaceful invasion in the sense, because no one was going to stand up to them. And Ribbentrop was at a luncheon given to him by the British government. And then they'd invited Churchill, and Churchill was most surprised to be invited. He said he thought that maybe they invited him to show him that they had a, a dog which could bark and might bite. And at the same time, um, Churchill is, has a chat with Ribbentrop, and Ribbentrop says, remember, Mr. Churchill, if there is a war, we will have the Italians on our side this time. I love this line. And Churchill <laughs> says, recounting Italy's less than stellar performance in World War I, states, it's only fair, Mr. Ambassador, we had them the last time. <laughs> that sense of humor, eh? Yeah. Unrivaled in politics. Amazing that his humor came through at, at hmm. the most crucial situations. It was ir irrepressible. King was not obvious. You mentioned earlier on King had no sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's not quite true, if I can Push state. back, by all means. <laughs> well, I've got one which I do recount. OK. In 1928, well, King, there was, there was a private king and there was a public king. 
King did not look on the Canadian House of Commons as a venue where there should be humor. The only time I could find any humor at all in the House of Commons from King was in 1928. And it was, it was actually at the expense of the opposition leader, R.B. Bennett, who was also a bachelor like King, but mm -hmm. also a noted ladies man. And the situation was regarding the Dukabor sect in British Columbia, who used to draw, draw attention to their protests by shedding their clothes. And an irate member from British Columbia states to uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, what will you do if a crowd of naked women arrive on Parliament Hill? King rose to his feet, looked over at Bennett and said, I'd send for the leader of the opposition. <laughs> okay, that's the one Only joke. Only one time. That's the one that joke. Was I, in, that was in public, though. I can in never private, remember. So it, was a, it was a different guy. You'd grant he was not... Uh, no, he wasn't. was not known for he a was, sense of humor. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, let's get back to the, uh, I guess, the drumbeat of war is on the way. Uh, Churchill now becomes First Lord of the Admiralty. King is the Prime Minister of Canada, of course. And I guess one of the... We should spend a little time here on... Probably his toughest challenge as Prime Minister, namely English Canada, very anxious yes. to go help Britain, French Canada, not wanting to get entangled no. in His Majesty's War. How does King walk that tightrope? He does it as King did in nearly everything he had to face. Anything difficult, he did it in, in short parts. The first one was to have conscription for the defense of Canada, mm -hmm. to which Quebec was in favor of. And then he thought later on in the war, we might have to bring this in. We don't. So what we'll do, we'll ask for a vote of confidence from the public. We'll have a referendum from the public that if necessary, we will bring in conscription. We've no intention of doing this, of course, but we just want that there so we don't have to go through. And of course, so they have the vote, and English Canada is overwhelming in favor, and French Canada is overwhelmingly against. Mm -hmm. But he gets that out of the way. And then, of course, the big crunch is in late 1944, when the Canadian military basically demands more troops. But again, even then, he goes through a procedure, he fires Colonel Ralston, the defense minister, in a situation which was um, drama more than efficiency. He didn't need to have done this. What had happened is that prior to earlier on in this, Ralston, uh, early in the war, Ralston had, had resigned and he'd given King a letter of resignation. King said, no, no, you can't, you can't do that now. It's war and all this. But he kept that in his back pocket. He kept the letter. That's a crafty guy. He kept the guy. letter in his back pocket. But when, uh, but November 1944 comes, and if he'd have said to Ralston privately, I want you to resign now. I'll accept it, but you, I want you to formally resign now because McNaughton, the head of the Canadian Army, he is prepared to take on your job. And he, th he thinks he can get volunteers without having to go to conscription. Ralston would have accepted that and he would have resigned. But for some reason, and I don't know the reason, and no one's explained this, he, come, he had a cabinet meeting. He basically says, um, I have a letter of resignation from Colonel Ralston. I'm now accepting this. Ralston, the first he knows about this, and Ralston says, oh, OK, I will formally resign. And then King goes out. I've got uh, McNaughton, who's well respected, especially in Quebec. And he will take on this, and he will I'm sure he can get the necessary troops. We need 16,000 troops. He'll have no trouble getting that. So the cabinet said, OK, well, we'll go along with this. Now, McNaughton doesn't get them. So then King has to bring in conscription. And, and he does it again. He just conscripts a couple of thousand people. Now, what year are we talking? This is later in the world. We're going, this is 44. 44, OK. Yeah, so we're, we're going too far. You're, you're, okay. you're, I'm going to pull you back because you've, exactly. you've gone okay. off into, into program number two right now. OK, and I wanna, sure, sure. I wanna, <coughs> Excuse me. In our, about the last two minutes here of program number one, Yes. Uh, I want to get us to September 1939. And 
Chamberlain eventually. Neville Chamberlain has to step down. The Tory backbench makes Winston Churchill the prime minister. And I, I, I wonder at that time, how much contact would he and King have had mm -hmm. about A, how to prosecute the war, and B, the need to get the Americans involved in the war? Can I go back to actually how, King, how Churchill got the position? Because this was undemocratic to say the, the least. In the, after the debate started on the Nav, Navic campaign in May 19, this was May 1940, it had been a complete catastrophe. They were trying to get a position in northern Norway because Germany had already invaded it. it. It didn't go at all. The person who should have resigned was the First Lord of the Admiralty, Churchill. But it became a critique of the war effort and of the Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain. Chamberlain was forced to resign. And how the procedure to get his successor, Chamberlain and the King George VI discussed the situation, and they both agree who should be the new Prime Minister. Hold that thought. This is a perfect cliffhanger, because we're out of time. Oh. And so you're going to tell us at the beginning of the next program okay. how, in fact, this all resolved itself. I will. I love the way you've just sort of set this up for next time. Thank okay. you. Terry Reardon will join us again tomorrow night, and obviously you have to be here as well to hear how this resolved itself. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.